Thanks. <clears throat> right, so uh, I guess my title that Rosemary just, uh, just said. Right, so, um, <clears throat> so this study is looking at average illumination conditions for Phobos. And so the motivation for this is it's part of an um, environmental study um, uh, from, from Dream 2 uh, in, into the Phobos environment. So from a science perspective, uh, illumination conditions inform uh, so energy input to a system, thermal conditions, uh, volatile sequestration, you know, particularly thermal stability in the subsurface, um, whether or not you know, ice can survive uh, for, for long periods um, in the subsurface. Thermal ice pumping, that's where sort of volatiles that land on the surface can actually be driven down, down uh, you know, to depth and then sequestered. Uh, and also it can be sort of used as a proxy for space weathering. Uh, so for <coughs> illumination conditions, uh, shape is important. So um, some previous studies uh, of the thermal environment and looking at volatiles treated Phobos as a, a sphere or a trax or ellipsoid, and, and that really misses out a lot of detail, as, as I'll show. And also from an exploration point of view, as was kind of brought up yesterday in a couple of the Phobos talks, uh, you know, obviously, um, illumination conditions are important for exploration, so it helps to be able to see things. Uh, you can use it to optimize your solar power resources. Um, uh, and if there is water, then that's uh, an ISRU. Um, uh, you can use it via ISRU. And of course, uh, illumination and, and, and thermal constraints uh, on operations that you know, sometimes are things you can't do because of uh, lighting or thermal conditions. OK, so <clears throat> this is the, uh, the shape model that we use for this study. This is the best one I, I think that's available right now for Phobos. And so this is 100 meter uh, resolution, so about half a, half a degree resolution. And this is the Vilna uh, model that was um, produced from Mars Express observations. And so this is just an example of what it looks like. You can see the kind of levelly detail. You can see, you know, craters and craters and a lot of um, uh, surface detail. And so uh, uh, Phobos is, is tightly locked to Mars. So the same face of, is always, of Phobos is always pointing towards Mars. And so that, that's the Mars direction there. This is the orbit direction. And there's Stickney, the, the famous crater, sort of near the, near the leading edge. And so the semi-major axis is about 2.76 um, Mars radii. And so it's very close to Mars, you know, a lot, lot closer relatively than, than, the Earth, than the Earth's moon is to the Earth. And uh, so the orbital and rotation period is uh, seven hours, 39 minutes about. So it was really whizzes around the planet. OK, so, <clears throat> so one thing to appreciate for, is, is the Mars orbit. So obviously the, Mar uh, the Mars orbit is the same as the Phobos orbit, um, essentially, around the sun. And so this is us considering present day conditions. And so these are the last two um, recent Mars perihelia. And you can see here you kind of go um, uh, sort, of, sort of just short of 1.4 AU out, out past 1.6 AU. And this is the, the same major axis here at about 1.5 AU. And so, and so this orbit, Mars' orbit is a lot more elliptical um, than the Earth orbit. So, it's, so there's about a 21% a, a, a 20, uh, difference between ap aphelia and, and perihelia. And so then the one consequence of that is that seasons are different lengths uh, on Mars and Phobos. And, and we can see the effects of that. OK, and so then looking at sort of the orbit of Phobos around Mars, um, uh, so this is uh, for a year, this is, this is every 24th orbit uh, around, around uh, Phobos around, around Mars. And so this is the, the, the solar direction in this frame of reference. And uh, so what we're showing here, we've color-coded the dots so that the, 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 uh, the yellow dots are when Phobos is um, exposed to full sun, and the blue dots are when it's in full eclipse. And there are a few dots that are in between, but, but mostly it's the two. So this is showing us that uh, about 94% uh, of the time Phobos is getting full sun, about uh, nearly 6% of the time it's in, it's in eclipse, and 0.2% and and it's, it's sort of in between. And the obliquity. Um, of Phobos is about 25 degrees, so you can see there's that, that sort of, that's why it kind of uh, f fills out this sort of, um, sort of, sort of uh, shape here. And, um, and so it's interesting to note that there are times in, in, the, uh, in the year where Phobos actually doesn't go through Mars' shadow at all, so it's completely exposed to the sun the whole time. Okay, so just a quick note on how we set this up. Um, so as I mentioned, we're just considering present day conditions. Uh, in the past, uh, you know, the obliquity and other parameters will have varied with Mars. So, um, so typically, you assume that Phobos would, would have stayed kind of locked to the equatorial um, plane uh, around, around Mars. Um, so, so we include the effects of topography. So we, in each point, we consider a local horizon. And that tells us whether or not we're seeing the sun. Um, 
So, so the things we produce from this model are, are sort of solar visibility, so that includes both Mars eclipses and partial sun, so there's just half the sun poking above the rim of a crater, we can, we can factor that in. Um, then we have solar incidence angle, and, and then we can calculate solar flux. And then we can use these to then determine annual conditions and annual averages, which then can tell us about um, uh, the sequestration of ice and other things like that. And so the time step we've used is about 10 minutes, so that's every half an hour in local time, and we found that converged pretty well. So th these are pretty, pretty accurate predictions, we think. Okay, so uh, just to kind of familiarize yourself with the way we're going to present the data. So here's sort of, um, uh, sort of a, a map of um, the um, surface height relative to a reference uh, radial distance. And, uh, and so most of the data is going to be presented like with a sort of global map here, and then uh, a plot of um, uh, the northern hemisphere and, and, and southern hemisphere here. And I actually predicted the data onto a, the shape model, because if you just predict onto a sphere, the data looks really odd. So it actually makes a lot more sense if you do this. Okay. Okay, so first up, um, this is uh, average sun visibility. And so if you never see the sun, that's 0%. And if you see the sun all the time, that's 100%. So typically for something um, uh, spherical, you see the sun about half the time. <clears throat> so you notice straight away that we, okay, we, we go down to zero. So there are places on, uh, on, on, on Phobos that, well, it doesn't get quite down to zero, but don't see the sun very often at all. And see, especially around the, around the South Pole. And, uh, but we also go up to 60%. And you see there's some places around the, the, the rims of craters where we're getting past that 50%. And that was kind of initially a little bit surprising. But then I remembered, well, OK, uh, it turns out that the, um, <coughs> the, the summer in the northern hemisphere is when uh, Mars and Phobos are at um, aphelion. And so they're, so they're further from the sun, so they're spending more time there. So they consequently see, see the sun more, more often. And, uh, and to try to sort of summarize some of the results from here, I've got these sort of histograms down here. And so this is um, in the green lines are our area as a function of um, average sun visibility. And, uh, and the red line is, is the average latitude. And, that, and then so what this shows you is that, is that the areas that don't see much of the sun uh, tend to be um, uh, around the southern hemisphere. So that kind of, you know, is, is consistent with what you see up there. And then the areas that um, see a lot of sun tend to be in the north, which again is consistent with that plot. So that kind of trend is kind of backed out when you actually do the analysis. Okay, and oh yeah, and, there, and so there's, yeah, so there's probably not much area, maybe just a, probably less than a, a square kilometer that doesn't see the sun, sees the sun less than 10% of the time. Okay, so then next thing uh, we're interested in is the average solar flux, and this is in, in, in watts per meter squared. And, uh, and so this is kind of what we need for our, our thermal modeling. And, um, <clears throat> and, and again, if you kind of um, Look down here, you kind of see that the, uh, the areas that don't see much sun tend to be around the southern hemisphere, as you expect. But then when you get up to sort of other um, sort of fluxes, it tends to be pretty much even between north and south. OK, so I'll move on to the next one. And OK, so this is a, 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 a so we're really interested in temperature. Uh, another interesting thing to look at is the maximum time spent in continuous full shadow. So you know, where, is, where are the spots where, the, where it pretty much you know, see, doesn't see much of the sun? And so we see that there's a lot of um, red uh, around the equator, and that's pretty much saying that there's a, uh, the most of that region there, uh, you know, that it's about, um, it's, it's the, the amount of time it's, uh, it's this is controlled by the um, diurnal, um, uh, the, the um, uh, rotation period, basically, right? And, uh, but then there are other areas near the poles which, uh, which are much, much longer. So this is almost getting to one full Mars year, but not quite. And uh, so then we look down at the histogram, uh, which is kind of, look at the green line, which is area, we can see there's a peak here where that's kind of the uh, illumination time is controlled by um, the orbital period. And then up, up here we see a second peak, uh, uh, which, is, um, which is more you know, controlled by seasonal effects. And so that kind of, it's kind of nice to pull out, pull out that difference. Okay. All right. Um, I feel like I've probably skipped this. Um, I think I've said most of this stuff already. <laughs> Okay, so then uh, onto the onto the thermal modeling. So so we take those illumination results, and the aim here is to um, is to be able to say something about um, you know temperatures and and say say some, some things about sequestration of water and that type of stuff. So um, so we've taken a very simple approach to this thermal modeling. So the two end member cases are the isothermal latitude model. So that's where you typically assume infinite inertia, and the other case uh, end end member is the thermal standard thermal model, which is kind of zero inertia. And uh, so so the the, the real temperature is somewhere in between. And so we've uh, had a, made an attempt at sort of taking a hybrid approach where we try and uh, you know, find some sort of compromise in between. 
Um, so the bond albedo uh, for uh, Phobos is about, um, about 5%. So this is really low. So this is comparable to fresh asphalt. So it's a, it's a very dark, dark object. OK, so from our previous studies, which have kind of uh, used sort of simpler shapes for Phobos, uh, typically the day-night amplitude is about 100 Kelvin. And so, so on average, the difference between day and night is about 35 Kelvin. So that's kind of the sort of the difference we're expecting typically between, between night and day on average. Uh, OK, and then we also we leveraged the results uh, from previous studies uh, using more, more sophisticated thermal modeling. Uh, and these have found that water ice uh, should be able to survive in the top few meters of regolith on asteroids and similar bodies on billion-year timescales, even the average temperature over the year is uh, less than 145 Kelvin. And that was a, a result from uh, Shurkoffer, um, 2008. And then similarly, there's the, uh, the idea of having a thermal ice pump. Uh, uh, now, this process could drive water ice into the subsurface. And this requires that the uh, maximum temperature is above 120 Kelvin, and the mean is less than 105 Kelvin um, uh, uh, you know, over a year. And that's a result from Shurkoffer and uh, uh, Horenson, uh, 2014. And so we're kind of looking at these are the numbers we're kind of be, going to be looking for. OK. So then uh, first up, uh, these are the uh, maximum temperatures. Um, so we just took the, the, the point. So for every point on, on the map, we just look to see you know, what's the maximum solar flux that that point receives, and then just convert that to a maximum temperature. So very, very simple approach. And here you can see that everywhere kind of gets above 180 Kelvin and maybe even above sort of 320 Kelvin on the surface. It can get, get you know, pr pretty warm. And so clearly this easily kind of satisfies that thermal pumping requirement. And, um, and again, so we look at this uh, plot here, we see that um, the places that, that see the maximum temperature tend to be um, biased towards the northern hemisphere. So it kind of seems to be consistent with what we saw before for, for just illumination conditions. OK, uh, so then <coughs> we have a look at the average day side temperatures. And these kind of vary from about, a, about, a, I don't know, 100 and about 120 ish Kelvin up. And that's sort of just, just um, sort of typical daytime temperatures. And so pretty much we, we want to calculate those so then we can um, sort of uh, figure out what the average uh, temperature is over the whole of Phobos is. And so we make some assumptions about sort of um, typical um, uh, differences between day side and night side temperatures. And we come up with this, this average hybrid temp temperature, which is kind of somewhat preliminary. And um, so, so on this map, we see that we are getting uh, play, uh, some, some regions that are getting below 100, 100 Kelvin. Uh, not, the areas are pretty tiny. Um, so, uh, so this suggests uh, that they're, 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 OK, so we look on this map here. We see about 145 Kelvin. So that so it says there, are, there could be some regions you know, a small area on Phobos that where, where water ice could be stable in the subsurface. And, um, and we do get some areas that get below 105 Kelvin. So maybe there could be some thermal ice pumping in some very, very, very small regions on Phobos. And, uh, and certainly, if you're going to explore there, you know, um, that kind of aiming for those regions first might, might, be, might be a good idea. And, uh, but I needed a little bit of did a bit more, more analysis to kind of refine that and, and sort of identify those regions. Uh, OK. So, um, in summary from this study, so we find the maximum temperatures uh, occur in the southern hemisphere. And, and this is partly well, this is due to the fact that, that summer in the southern hemisphere is near uh, perihelion, so it's nearer the sun, so uh, it gets warmer. And so, and so in fact, actually, the southern hemisphere tends to experience uh, the extremes of illumination and temperature. So it gets very cold, so it spends a long time in winter. Um, but then it gets very hot when it has its summer. And so. So it clearly, Phobos, Phobos topography has a significant influence on illumination and temperature. Um, so under, under these present-day conditions, this analysis said it, it indicates that it's conceivable that small regions might exist where subsurface water ice is stable, and perhaps maybe even having um, some thermal ice pump effects. And, um, <clears throat> and OK, okay we see some north-south north symmetries, which we discussed already. And so this is kind of interesting. So this, so this could suggest that some, sometime in the past that um, you know, Phobos could have been a pretty good witness plate for Mars, for the Mars atmosphere. So as the Mars atmosphere was coming off of, com coming out, passing, th passing by Phobos, um, it, you know, it, it could, it could have trapped um, some, some volatiles in its subsurface. And um, yep, and we're looking for some more interesting locations that you might want to explore. Okay, thanks. Temperatures you quote are surface temperatures, right? That's right, yeah. Um, 
The Diviner team has tools to uh, simulations that allow one to estimate a uh, water stability depth. Yep. Could that be applied here as well? Yeah. Um, what are the there details of Phobos composition or something that make that inherently uncertain? I, I think a, a direct comparison between them the moon and Phobos, uh, yeah, there are some differences in some of the thermal properties. I mean, I think Phobos is a lot more porous and there are some other different characteristics. But certainly, um, so that, that I, I mentioned about the, um, the Schokoffer um, analysis yeah. where he kind of gave you that sort of um, surface temperature as a reference. So yeah, so he had a much more sophisticated sort of multi-layer thermal model and, and so he did, he did that. So I'm kind of leveraging his, 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 um, his study to sort of say, okay, if I can have an estimate of the surface temperature using this sort of simpler approach, um, so, so, we, so with this modeling, the, the illumination model is, is, is pretty sophisticated, but the thermal modeling I do afterwards is kind of, you know, very, very basic, really. Yeah. Oh. Uh, did you take uh, infrared radiation from Mars into account? It should be significant. Um, yeah, y uh, uh, you're correct. Yeah, there is a, a lot of. Um, uh, uh, flux from radiation from, from Mars, but we didn't take that into account right now. So we're now we're just considering direct solar illumination. But certainly um, we would like to do a more sophisticated thermal modeling, and in that case we definitely would have to include the um, contribution from, uh, from Mars itself. Yeah. So I have a question. So um, do you have candidates where, where you look for ice? Um, yeah, I, actually I didn't mention it, but there are, um, there are a few um, sort of artifacts with the DEM where there are some sort of funny ridges which are kind of aren't real. And so we need to go and try and deal with those. <laughs> so we're not so we're not kind of, you know, predicting there's a, you know, a, a, there's kind of a funny strange ridge in the map in your DEM and, and claiming that's going to be where you're going to find stuff because that's just a, an artifact of where they drain into the, the shape model. Um, but yeah, that's that's the plan is try and find some points where maybe um, You've got somewhere that's, that, that remains very cold, could have trapped water ice in the subsurface, but maybe is next to somewhere that gets a reasonable amount of illumination, doesn't get too cold, so you can actually put something there and explore the, the cold region, you know, fairly easily. Mm -hmm. That's the plan, yeah. So we, we have time for a discussion of everything. Oh, okay. One more question. Uh, we know that a chain, uh, that a season of perihelion on Mars changes and uh, obliquity of Mars changes. Uh, so, and it is a rather short term time scale, so it should uh, affect preservation of water and use of Phobos as witness plate, uh, just a comment. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, so the the obliquity of Mars has changed in the past. I think there's a, um, a couple of periodicities, like one that's around 10 to the five years, one that's around 10 to the six. So yeah, that does vary. And so, <clears throat> so yeah, I, need, I probably need to do, go back a long time to kind of really, you know, identify regions that could have captured that. But this is just a first step and, you know, this is tractable to do one year. Okay, so I think, I think we're supposed to invite the, um, the speakers from this session.